Recording by Dale Grothman. A powerful story of stark terror, and the dreadful thing that happened in a lone house in the Maine woods. Doom of the House of Duryea, by Earl Pierce Jr. Duryea, a young handsome man, came to meet his father for the first time in twenty years. As he strode into the hotel lobby, long strides had the spring of elastic in them. Idle eyes lifted to appraise him, for he was an impressive figure, somehow grim, with exultation. The desk clerk looked up from his habitual smile of expectation. How do you do, Mr. So-and-so? And his fingers strayed to the green fountain pen that stood in the holder on the desk. Arthur Duryea cleared his throat, but still his voice was clogged and unsteady. To the clerk he said, I'm looking for my father, Dr. Henry Duryea. I understand he is registered here. He has recently arrived from Paris. The clerk lowered his glance to the list of names. Dr. Duryea is in suite 600, sixth floor. He looked up, his eyebrows arched questioningly. Are you staying too, sir, Mr. Duryea? Arthur took the pen and scribbled his name rapidly. Without a further word, neglecting even to get his key and own room number, he turned and walked to the elevators. Not until he reached his father's suite on the sixth floor did he make an audible noise, and this was a mere sigh, which fell from his lips like a prayer. The man who opened the door was unusually tall, his slender frame clothed in tight-fitting black. He hardly dared to smile. His clean-shaven face was bare, an almost livid whiteness against the sparkle in his eyes. His jaw had a bluish luster. Arthur! The word was scarcely a whisper. It seemed choked up quietly, as if it had been repeated time and again on his thin lips. Arthur Duryea felt the kindness in those eyes go through him, and then he was in his father's embrace. Later, when these two grown men had regained their outer calm, they closed the door and went into the drawing-room. The elder Duryea held out a humidor of fine cigars, and his hand shook so hard when he held the match that his son was forced to cup his own hands about the flame. They both had tears in their eyes, but their eyes were smiling. Henry Duryea placed a hand on his son's shoulder. This is the happiest day of my life, he said. You can never know how much I have longed for this moment. Arthur, looking into that glance, realized with glowing pride that he had loved his father all his life despite any of those things which had been cursed against him he sat down on the edge of a chair i i don't know how to act he confessed you surprise me dad you're so different from what i had expected a cloud came over dr duryea's feature what did you expect arthur he demanded quickly an evil eye a shaven head and knotted jowls please dad no arthur's words clipped short i don't think i ever really visualized you i knew you would be a splendid man but i thought you'd look older more like a man who has really suffered i have suffered more than i can ever describe but seeing you again and the prospect of spending the rest of my life with you has more than compensated for my sorrows even during the twenty years we were apart i found an iconic joy in learning of your progress in college and in your american game of football then you've been following my work yes arthur i've received monthly reports ever since you left me from my study in paris i've been really close to you working out your problems as if they were my own and now that the twenty years are complete the ban which kept us apart is lifted forever from now on son we shall be the closest of companions unless your aunt celia has succeeded in her terrible mission 
the mention of that name caused an unfamiliar chill to come between the two men it stood for something in each of them which gnawed their minds like a malignancy but to the younger durier in his intense effort to forget the awful past her name as well as her madness must be forgotten he had no wish to carry on this subject of conversation for it betrayed an internal weakness which he hated with forced determination and a ludicrous lift of his eyebrows he said celia is dead and her silly superstition is dead also from now on dad we're going to enjoy life as we should bygones are really bygones in this case dr durier closed his eyes slowly as though an exquisite pain had gone through him then you have no indignation he questioned you have none of your aunt's hatred indignation hatred arthur laughed aloud ever since i was twelve years old i had disbelieved celia's stories i have known that these horrible things were impossible that they belonged to the ancient category of mythology and tradition how then can i be indignant and how can i hate you how can i do anything but recognize cecilia for what she was a mean frustrated woman cursed with an insane grudge against you and your family i tell you dad that nothing she has ever said can possibly come between us again henry durier nodded his head his lips were tight together and the muscles in his throat held back a cry in the same soft tone of defense he spoke further doubting words are you so sure of your subconscious mind arthur can you be so certain that you are free from all suspicion however vague is there not a lingering premonition a premonition which warns of peril no dad no arthur shot to his feet i don't believe it i never believed it i know as any sane man would that you are neither a vampire nor a murderer you know it too and cecilia knew it only she was mad that family rot is dispelled father this is a civilized century belief in vampirism is sheer lunacy why, why it's too absurd even to think about you have the enthusiasm of youth said his father in a rather tired voice but have you not heard the legend arthur stepped back instinctively he moistened his lips or their dryness might crack them the legend he said the word in a curious hush of awed softness as he had heard his aunt cecilia say it many times before that awful legend that you that i eat my children oh god father arthur went to his knees as a cry burst through his lips dad that that's ghastly we must forget cecilia's ravings you are affected then said dr durier bitterly affected certainly i'm affected but only as i should be by such an accusation cecilia was mad i tell you those books she showed me years ago those folk tales of vampires and ghouls they burned into my infantile mind like acid they haunted me day and night in my youth and caused me to hate you worse than death itself but in heaven's name father i've outgrown those things as i have outgrown my clothes i'm a man now do you understand that a man with a man's sense of logic yes i understand henry durier threw his cigar into the fireplace and placed a hand on his son's shoulder we shall forget cecilia he said as i told you in my letter i have rented a lodge in maine where we can go to be alone for the rest of the summer we'll get in some fishing and hiking and perhaps some hunting but first arthur i must be sure in my own mind that you are sure in yours i must be sure you won't bar your door against me at night and sleep with a loaded revolver at your elbow i must be sure you're not afraid of going up there alone with me and dying his voice ended abruptly 
as if an age-long dread had taken hold of it his son's face was waxen with sweat standing out like pearls on his brow he said nothing but his eyes were filled with questions which his lips could not put into words his own hand touched his father's and tightened over it henry durier drew his hand away i'm sorry he said his eyes looked straight over arthur's head this thing must be thrashed out now i believe you when you say you discredit cecilia's stories but for a sake greater than sanity i must tell you the truth behind the legend and believe me arthur there is a truth he climbed to his feet and walked to the window which looked out over the street below for a moment he gazed into space silent then he turned and looked down at his son you have heard only your aunt's version of the legend arthur doubtless it was wrapped into a thing far more hideous than it actually was if that is possible doubtless she spoke to you of the inquisitorial stake in carcassonne where one of my ancestors perished also she may have mentioned that book vampires which a former durier is supposed to have written but certainly she told you about your two younger brothers my poor motherless children who were sucked bloodless in their cradles arthur durier passed a hand across his aching eyes these words so often repeated by that witch of an aunt stirred up the same visions which made his childhood nights sleepless with terror he could hardly bear to hear them again and from the very man to whom they were accredited listen arthur the elder durier went on quickly his voice low with the pain it gave him you must know that true basis to your aunt's hatred you must know of that curse that curse of vampirism which is supposed to have followed the duriers through five centuries of french history but which we can dispel as pure superstition so often connected with ancient families but i must tell you that part of the legend is true your two younger brothers actually died in their cradles bloodless and i stood trial in france for their murder and my name was smirched throughout all of europe with such an inhuman damnation that it drove your aunt and you to america and has left me childless hated and ostracized from society the world over i must tell you that on that terrible night in durier castle i had been working late on historical volumes of crespit and prin and on the loathsome tome vampires i must tell you of the soreness that was in my throat and of the heaviness of the blood that coursed through my veins and of that presence which is neither man nor animal which i knew was some place near me yet neither within the castle nor outside of it and which was closer to me than my heart and more terrible to me than the touch of the grave i was at the desk in my library my head swimming in a delirium which left me senseless until dawn there were nightmares that frightened me frightened me arthur a grown man who had dissected countless cadavers in morgues and in medical schools i know that my tongue was swollen in my mouth and that brine moistened my lips and that a rottenness pervaded my body like a fever i can make no recollection of sanity or of consciousness that night remains vivid unforgettable yet somehow completely in shadows when i had fallen asleep if in god's name it was sleep i was slumped across my desk but when i woke in the morning i was lying face down on my couch so you see arthur i had moved during that night and i had never known it what i'd done and where i'd gone during those dark hours will always remain an impenetrable mystery but i do know this on the morrow i was torn from my sleep by shrieks of maids and butlers and by that mad wailing of your aunt i stumbled through the open door to my study and in the nursery i saw those two babies there lifeless white and dry like mummies and with twin holes in their necks that were caked black with their own blood 
Oh, I don't blame you for your incredulousness, Arthur. I cannot believe it yet myself, nor shall I ever believe it. The belief of it would drive me to suicide, and still the doubting of it drives me mad with horror. All of France was doubtful, and even the savants who defended my name at the trial found that they could not explain it, nor disbelieve it. The case was quieted by the Republic, for it might have shaken science to its very foundation, and split the pedestals of religion and logic. I was released from the charge of murder, but the actual murder has hung about me like a stench. The coroners who examined those tiny cadavers found them both dry of all their blood, but could find no blood on the floor of the nursery, nor in the cradles. Something from hell stalked the halls of Duryea that night, and I should blow my brains out if I dare to think deeply of who that was. You, too, my son, would have been dead and bloodless if you hadn't been sleeping in a separate room with your door barred on the inside. You were a timid child, Arthur. You were only seven years old, but you were filled with the folklore of those mad Lombards and the decadent poetry of your aunt. On the same night, while I was some place between heaven and hell, you also heard the padded footsteps on the stone corridor, and heard the tugging at your door handle. For in the morning you complained of a chill, and of terrible nightmares which frightened you in your sleep. I only thank God that your door was barred. Arthur Duryea's voice choked into a sob which brought the stinging tears back to his eyes. He paused to wipe his face, and to dig his fingers into his palm. You understand, Arthur, that for twenty years under my sworn oath at the Palace of Justice I could neither see you nor write to you. Twenty years, my son, while all that time you had grown to hate me and to spit at my name. Not until your aunt's death could you call yourself a Duryea, and now you come to me at my bidding and say you love me as a son should love his father. Perhaps it is God's forgiveness for everything. Now at last we shall be together, and that terrible, unexplainable past will be buried forever. He put his handkerchief back in his pocket and walked slowly to his son. He dropped to one knee, his hands gripping Arthur's arm. My son, I say no more to you. I have told you the truth as I alone know it. I may be, by all accounts, some ghoulish creation of Satan on earth. I may be a child killer, a vampire, some morbidly diseased specimen of Rycolicus, things which science cannot explain. Perhaps the dread legend of the Duryeas is true. Artel Duryea was convicted of murdering his brother in the same monstrous fashion in the year 1576 and he died in flames at the stake. Francois Duryea, in 1802, blew his head apart with a blunderbuss on the morning after his youngest son was found dead, apparently from anemia. And there are others of whom I cannot bear to speak that would chill your soul if you were to hear of them. So you see, Arthur, there is a hellish tradition behind our family. There is a heritage which no sane god would ever have allowed. The future of the Duryeas lies in you, for you are the last of the race. I pray with all my heart that Providence will permit you to live your fullest share of years, and to leave other Duryeas behind you. And so, if ever again I feel that presence as I did in Duryea Castle, I am going to die as Francois Duryea died over a hundred years ago. He stood up, and his son stood up by his side. If you are willing to forget, Arthur, we shall go up to the lodge in Maine. There is a life we've never known awaiting us. We must find that life, and we must find the happiness which a curious fate snatched from us on those Lombardy sourlands twenty years ago. 2. Henry Duryea's tall stature, coupled with a slenderness of frame and a sleekness of muscle, gave him an appearance that was unusually gaunt. His son couldn't help but think of that word as he sat on the rustic porch of the lodge, 
watching his father sunning himself at the lake's edge henry durier had a kindness in his face at times an almost sublime kindness which great prophets often possess but when his face was partly in shadow particularly above his brow there was a frightening tone that came into his features for it was a tone of farness of mysticism of conjuration somehow in the late evenings he assumed the unapproachable mantle of a dreamer and sat silently before the fire his mind ever off in unknown places in that little lodge there was no electricity and the glow of the oil lamps played curious tricks with the human expression which frequently resulted in something inhuman it may have been the dusk of night the flickering of the lamps but arthur durier had certainly noticed how his father's eyes had sunken further into his head and how his cheeks were tighter and the outline of his teeth pressed into the skin about his lips it was nearer sundown on the second day of their stay at timber lodge six miles away the dirt road wound on to holton near the canadian border so it was lonely there on a solitary little lake hemmed in closely with dark evergreens and the sky which drooped low over the dirt summited mountains within the lodge was a homey fireplace and a glossy elk's head which peered out above the mantel there were guns and fishing tackle on the walls shelves of reliable american fiction mark twain melville stockton and a well-worn edition of bret hart a fully supplied kitchen and a wood stove furnished them with hearty meals which were welcome after a whole day's tramp in the woods on that evening henry durier prepared a select french stew out of the available vegetables and a can of soup they ate well then stretched out before the fire for a smoke they were outlining a trip to the orient together when the back door blew open with a terrific bang and the wind swept into the lodge with a coldness which chilled them both a storm henry durier said rising to his feet sometimes they have em up here and they're pretty bad the roof might leak over your bedroom perhaps you'd like to sleep down here with me his fingers strayed playfully over his son's head as he went into the kitchen to bar the swinging door arthur's room was upstairs next to a spare room filled with extra furniture he'd chosen it because he liked the altitude and because the only other bedroom was occupied he went upstairs swiftly and silently his roof didn't leak it was absurd to think it might it had been his father again suggesting that they sleep together he had done it before in a jesting whispering way as if to challenge them both if they dared sleep together arthur came back downstairs dressed in his bathrobe and slippers he stood on the fifth stair rubbing a two days growth of beard i think i'll shave tonight he said to his father may i use your razor henry durier draped in a black raincoat and with his face haloed in the brim of a rain hat looked up from the hall a frown glided obscurely from his features not at all son sleeping upstairs arthur nodded and quickly said are you going out yes i'm going to tie the boats up tighter i'm afraid the lake will rough it up a bit durier jerked back the door and stepped outside the door slammed shut and his footsteps sounded on the wood flooring of the porch arthur came slowly down the remaining steps he saw his father's figure pass across the dark rectangle of a window saw a flash of lightning that suddenly printed his grim silhouette against the glass he sighed deeply a sigh which burned in his throat for his throat was sore and aching then he went into the bedroom found the razor lying in plain view on the birch tabletop as he reached for it 
His glance fell upon his father's open Gladstone bag, which rested at the foot of the bed. There was a book resting there, half hidden by a grey flannel shirt. It was a narrow, yellow-bound book, oddly out of place. Frowning, he bent down and lifted it from the bag. It was surprisingly heavy in his hands, and he noticed a faint, sickening odor of decay, which drifted from it like a perfume. The title of the volume had been thumbed away into an indecipherable blur of gold letters, but pasted across the front cover was a white strip of paper, on which was typewritten the word, Infantophagy. He flipped open the cover and ran his eyes over the title page. The book was printed in French, an early French, yet to him wholly comprehensible. The publication date was 1580, in Caen. Breathlessly, he turned back the second page and saw a chapter heading, Vampires. He slumped to one elbow across the bed. His eyes were four inches from those mildewed pages. His nostrils reeked with the stench of them. He skipped long paragraphs of pedantic jargon on theology. He scanned brief accounts of strange, blood-eating monsters, Vercoligus and leprechauns. He read of Joan d'Arc, of Ludwig Prynne, and muttered aloud the Latin snatches of the Episcopi. He passed pages in quick succession, his fingers shaking with the fear of it, and his eyes hanging heavily in their sockets. He saw a vague reference to Enoch, and saw the terrible drawings by an ancient Dominican of Rome. Paragraph after paragraph he read, the horror-striking testimony of Niter's Ant Hill, the testimony of people who died shrieking at the stake, the recitals of grave tenders, of jurists, and hangmen. Then, unexpectedly, among all of this monumental vestige, there appeared before his eyes the name of Autel Durier, and he stopped reading as though invisibly struck. Thunder clapped near the lodge and rattled the window panes. The deep rolling of the bursting clouds echoed over the valley, but he heard none of it. His eyes were on those two short sentences which his father, or someone, had underlined with dark red crayon. The execution four years ago of Artel Durier does not end the Durier controversy. Time alone will decide whether the demon has claimed that family from its beginning to its end. Arthur read on about the trial of Artel Durier before Veniti, the Cassicorian Inquisitor General, read with mounting horror the evidence which had sent the far gone Durier to the pillar, the evidence of a bloodless corpse who had been Artel Durier's younger brother. Unmindful now of the tremendous storm which had centered over Timber Lake, unheeding the clatter of windows and the swish of pines on the roof, even of his father who worked down at the lake's edge in a drenching rain, Arthur fastened his glance to the blurred print of those pages, sinking deeper and deeper into the garbled legends of the Dark Age. On the last page of the chapter he saw again the name of his ancestor, Autel Durier. He traced a shaking finger over the narrow lines of words, and when he finished reading them, he rolled sideways on the bed, and from his lips came a sobbing, mumbling prayer. God, oh God in heaven, protect me! For he had read, As in the case of Autel Durier, we observe that this specimen of Vercoligus preys only upon the blood of its own family. It possesses none of the characteristics of the undead vampire, being usually a living male person of otherwise normal appearances, unsuspecting of its inherited demonism. But this Vercoligus cannot act according to its demonical possession unless it is in the presence of a second member of the same family who acts as a medium between the man and its demon. 
this medium has none of the traits of the vampire but it senses the being of this creature when the metamorphosis is about to occur by reason of intense pains in the head and throat both the vampire and the medium undergo similar reactions involving nausea nocturnal visions and physical disquietude when these two outcasts are within a certain distance of each other the coalescence of inherited demonism is complete and the vampire is subject to its attacks demanding blood for its sustenance no member of the family is safe from these times for the vercolicus acting in its true agency on earth will unerringly seek out the blood in rare cases where other victims are unavailable the vampire will take the blood from the very medium which made it possible this vampire is born into certain aged families and naught but death can destroy it it is not conscious of its blood madness and acts only in a psychic state the medium also is unaware of its terrible role and when these two are together despite any lapse in years the fission of inheritance is so violent that no power known on earth can turn it back three the lodge door slammed shut with a sudden interrupting bang the lock grated and henry durier's footsteps sounded on the planked floor arthur shook himself from the bed he had only time to fling that haunting book into the gladstone bag before he sensed his father standing in the doorway you you've not shaved arthur durier's words spliced hesitantly were toneless he glanced from the tabletop to the gladstone and to his son he said nothing for a moment he glanced inscrutably then it's blowing up a storm outside arthur swallowed the first words which had come into his throat nodding quickly yes isn't it quite a storm he met his father's gaze his face burning i i don't think i'll shave dad my head aches durier came swiftly into the room and pinned arthur's arms in his grasp what do you mean your head aches how does your throat no arthur jerked himself away he laughed it's that french stew of yours it hit me in the stomach he stepped past his father and started up the stairs the stew durier pivoted on his heel possible i think i feel it myself arthur stopped his face suddenly white you too the words were hardly audible their glances met clashed like dueling swords for ten seconds neither of them said a word or moved a muscle arthur from the stairs looking down his father below gazing up at him in henry durier the blood drained slowly from his face and left a purple etching across the bridge of his nose and above his eyes he looked like a death's head arthur winced at the sight and twisted his eyes away he turned to go up the remaining stairs son he stopped again his hand tightened on the banister yes dad Durier put his foot on the first stair. I want you to lock your door tonight. The wind would keep it banging. Yes, breathed Arthur, and pushed up the stair to his room. Dr. Durier's hollow footsteps sounded in steady, unhesitating beats across the floor of the Timber Lake Lodge. Sometimes they stopped, and the crackling hiss of a sulfur match took their place then perhaps a distended sigh and again footsteps arthur crouched at the open door of his room his head was cocked for those noises from below in his hand was a double barrel shotgun of violent gauge thud 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 then a pause and a clinking of glass and the gurgling of liquid the sigh the tread of his feet over the floor he's thirsty arthur thought 
thirsty. Outside, the storm had grown into fury. Lightning zigzagged between the mountains, filling the valley with weird phosphorescence. Thunder, like drums, rolled incessantly. Within the lodge, the heat of the fireplace piled the atmosphere thick with stagnation. All the doors and windows were locked shut. The oil lamps glowed weakly, a pale, anemic light. Henry Durier walked to the foot of the stairs and stood looking up. Arthur sensed his movement and ducked back into his room, the gun gripped in his shaky fingers. Then Henry Durier's footsteps sounded on the first stair. Arthur slumped to one knee. He buckled a fist against his teeth as a prayer tumbled through them. Durier climbed the second step, and another, and still one more. On the fourth stair he stopped. Arthur, his voice cut into the silence like a crack of a whip, Arthur, will you come down here? Yes, Dad. Bedraggled, his body hanging like cloth, young Durier took five steps to the landing. We can't be zanies, cried Arthur Durier. My soul is sick with dread. Tomorrow we're going back to New York. I'm going to get the first boat to open sea. Please come down here. He turned around and descended the stairs to his room. Arthur choked back the words that had lumped in his mouth. Half dazed, he followed. In the bedroom, he saw his father stretched face up along the bed. He saw a pile of rope at his father's feet. Tie me to the bedpost, Arthur, came the command. Tie both my hands and both my feet. Arthur stood gaping. Do as I tell you. Dad, what the horror? Don't be a fool. You read that book. You know what relation you are to me. I'd always hoped it was Cecilia, but now I know it's you. I should have known it on that night twenty years ago, when you complained of a headache and nightmares. Quickly, my head rocks with pain. Tie me. Speechless, his own pain piercing him with agony, Arthur fell to the grisly task. Both hands he tied, and both feet tied them so firmly to the iron post that his father could not lift himself an inch off the bed. Then he blew out the lamps, and without a further glance at that Prometheus, he reascended the stairs to his room, and slammed and locked his door behind him. He looked once at the breech of his gun, and set it against a chair by his bed. He flung off his robe and slippers, and within five minutes he was senselessly in slumber. 4. He slept late, and when he awakened his muscles were as stiff as boards, and the lingering vision of a nightmare clung before his eyes. He pushed his way out of bed, stood dazedly on the floor. A dull, numbing cruciation circulated through his head. He felt bloated, coarse, and running with internal mucus. His mouth was dry. His gums were sore and stinging. He tightened his hands as he lunged for the door. Dad, he cried, and heard his voice break in his throat. Sunlight filtered through the window at the top of the stairs. The air was hot and dry, and carried in it a mild odor of decay. Arthur suddenly drew back at that odor drew back with a gasp of awful fear, for he recognized it, that stench, the heaviness of his blood, the rawness of his tongue and gums. Age long, it seemed, yet rising like a spirit in his memory. All of these things he had known and felt before. He leaned against the banister and half slid, half stumbled down the stairs. His father had died during the night. He lay like a waxen figure tied to his bed, his face done up in knots. Arthur stood dumbly at the foot of the bed for only a few seconds. Then he went back upstairs to his room. Almost immediately he emptied both barrels of the shotgun into his head. 
the tragedy at timber lake was discovered accidentally three days later a party of fishermen upon finding the two bodies notified state authorities and an investigation was directly under way arthur durier had undoubtedly met death at his own hands the condition of his wounds and the manner with which he held the lethal weapon at once foreclosed the suspicion of any foul play but the death of dr henry durier confronted the police with an inexplicable mystery for his trussed-up body unscathed except for two jagged holes over the jugular vein had been drained of all its blood the autopsy protocol of henry durier lay death to undetermined causes and it was not until the yellow tabloids commenced an investigation into the durier family history that the incredible and fantastic explanations were offered to the public obviously such talk was held in popular contempt the end of doom of the house of durier by earl pierce jr